morning, Kettle Run. Today is Friday, April 28th, and I'm Erin Hogg. Today is the last day to order a yearbook. Yearbooks can be bought online at jostens.com. No extra yearbooks will be ordered. A list is posted outside of room 223 of all students who have purchased a yearbook. Mark your calendars. Next week, May 5th, 6th, and 7th is the Spring Musical. Once Upon a Mattress is a musical comedy set in a medieval castle featuring some of your favorite students, singing, dancing, and acting out a hilarious and unexpected story. A mean queen, a cursed king, a young lady in trouble, and a knight struggling to do the right thing along with a whiny wizard, melancholy jester, gorgeous dancing girls, noble knights, and peevish peasants in a retelling of the fairy tale story, The Princess and the Pea. The show is Friday and Saturday night at 7 p.m. and Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. Students from fall term AP literature who would like a review session before the AP exam on May 3rd, stop by Miss Krasny's room on 220 on Monday or Tuesday. All sports medicine applications are due Monday to Miss Campbell in the athletic training room. If you do not have an application on file, you will not be able to take sports medicine classes. The Spanish language lunch table is back today. Sit with members of the Spanish Honor Society and other students taking Spanish. This is a great way to practice for assessments or high, higher level classes. Plus, it's tons of fun. The only rule is you can't speak English. It's time for another At the Cinema. Nathan and Ian join us now with a look at 13 Reasons Why. I'm Ian. I'm Nathan. And this is at the cin cinema. cinema. So, what are we talking about today, Nathan? We wanted to change it up, so. Yeah. We're gonna be talking about 13 Reasons Why this week because everybody seems to be watching it, and nobody will shut up about it, good or bad. Everybody has, everybody has something to say, and I'm sick of it. So, I. I thought it was good. I mean, I enjoyed it. I just don't enjoy everybody talking about it all the time. It went on really slowly. Like, I was about episode six, and I was like, when is this thing going to end? Like, this is just going to drag me out for so long. It actually got boring until the end, honestly. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know what it's about, somehow you haven't heard about it, which is you might live under a rock or something. Um, but it's about this girl who kills herself and leaves tapes for all the people that called her to kill herself. Which is horrible. I yeah. Don't care about it, but, um. So the tapes are being passed around from person to person. Basically, the rule was once you get the tapes, you finish them, pass them on to the next person. And eventually, uh, this dude named Clay got them, and he kind of ruined it for everyone. I enjoyed the. I don't know. It was like it sort of gave you a look into what somebody may or may not think before they commit suicide. It, it opened up my eyes a little bit to. Um, like awareness. All right, Nathan. How did it impact the uh, you know the high schoolers of this generation seeing this, understanding? Hey, what I say might matter, or what I don't say might even matter, because like yeah, like I mean, bad. like I said, it uh, really made me think about what I say and how it could um, affect people. And I feel like it did that for most people that watched it. Like people, I feel like teenagers have just. Like, it's become the norm to verbally, like, abuse your friends a little bit, like, joke around with them. It's kind of like a running joke. Like, yeah, yeah, but, like, sometimes I know that I take it too far, and people around me take it too far, so I don't know, it's just sort of, like, made me think before I say things. If you're having issues, please reach out. You're not alone. Yeah, not alone. All right, Nathan, what are we, we going to do? What are we going to review next week? It's not us. It's going to be Chris and our No, again. it's going to be us, Nathan. We're taking over. No, it's not. We're um, taking over everything. No, it's not. Uh, it's Paul Boy Mall Cop 2. Thank you. The second one, not the first one. The second one. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Now for club news and sports with Chris Dodson. Thanks, Aaron. Any TSA members going to Technosphere State competitions need to attend a mandatory meeting after school on Monday in Mr. Davidson's room. Science Honor Society and After Palm will be hosting a craft and vendor fair in the Commons tomorrow from 10 to 3. Please join us for a fun 
day of shopping fun. There's a general Spanish Honor Society meeting after school today. The Hosa Club is hosting a blood drive after school today in room 310. What does this weekend's weather look like? Brad Jeff is joining us now with a look. Thanks, Chris. Okay, folks, today we're going to wear a high of 85 degrees with a perfectly sunny sky. But then as we move to tomorrow, we're going to 93 degrees is the high temperature with p.m. thunderstorms. And then Sunday, it'll clear up, high of 79 and partly cloudy skies. That's the weather for no better. Back to you. Thanks, Brad. The Boys Lacrosse program needs your help. Come to Chipotle on Sunday, May 7th, between 2 and 9 p.m., and 50% of your meal proceeds will be donated to the Boys Lacrosse program. Please mention KR Lacrosse when you are checking out. Have a great day. We'll leave you a look at the birthdays and the lunch menu. A Warrenton third grader who's only eight years old owes his life tonight to the gift of a stranger. Three weeks ago, Rutger Scott came down with what everyone thought was the flu, but by Sunday, doctors said he needed a new liver or he would die. Emily Schmidt is here now with more on what happened next. Emily? Allison and Leon, Rutger has always been in. My name is Rutger Scott. On November 11th, 2008, at 9 a.m., a young boy at the age of eight received a necessary liver transplant. I was that boy. The operation was performed by many surgeons at Georgetown Hospital in Washington, D.C. It was a dire case, one that took place ahead over 10,000 waiting patients. I needed that liver that night or I would have surely faced the hand of death. However, this documentary is not an examination of the pain that I went through to be here today, but a study of the motivation and trepidation that consumed the person who stood by my hospital bed every night of those arduous seven weeks. That person was my mother. Hi, my name is Tanya Scott and I'm the mom of Rutger Scott. And uh, this is the story about uh, Rutger's um, liver transplant that was performed on November 11th. 2008 at 9 a.m. 11th, 2008. Okay, uh, it all started when uh, Rutger got sick back in October of two. 2008 um, we thought it was a stomach virus a simple stomach virus but uh, he would go a few days of uh, being sick and then he would get better and we would think that he was getting better and he'd go back to school and then he would get worse again and so um, we actually thought he was better and, and feeling like himself and went to school on October 28 2008 and came home uh, completely yellow which is called jaundice. And even the whites of his eyes were yellow. So um, at eight and a half years old, I knew that wasn't normal. So I took him to his pediatrician and they drew blood and realized that his bilirubin levels um, were very high at 13 and they're supposed to be below one. That's his liver function test and how his liver is performing. And how did you feel when you learned that you needed the uh, liver transplant? Um, I don't really remember. All I know is that, like, I was young. I didn't know really right what to before think. You got sick. I, I didn't even know what a liver transplant so if you was. Want... All I know is that, like, yeah, I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to get better. I didn't know. I didn't feel anything because I, I felt like I was fine. I wanted to get home. Um, yeah, I just, I just didn't know how to feel. Well, uh, you refused pain meds after the first couple of days because they made you sick. So I, uh, I was, of course, in the hospital with you. I never left your side. So I would have to massage your feet and your legs for hours at a time. That was the only thing that would make you feel better. 
and you had issues where your IV lines got infected. The the IV, some whenever they'd get infected, I'd feel this this sudden pain. And then they couldn't find a vein that wouldn't roll or blow. And so they just could not stick you anywhere else because you had so many um, IVs in you. And of course they had that big um, IV line in your throat. Um, and your uh, we finally found one way up here by your shoulder, but uh, just rubbing your feet and your legs with lotion is the only thing that would make you calm down and keep you from feeling pain and, and often cause you to fall asleep. Oh, when I was in the hospital, what was the most, like, painful thing to see? Like, what what did you, I don't know. I don't, I don't mean to get you emotional, just like. This is you in the hospital. This was the most painful thing for, for any mom to see because you were intubated. And the night of surgery was the worst night because you, uh, you went into hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic shock. And we almost lost you. And they had to pump you full of eight units of blood and about 20 bags of saline. And I also, I also felt like they didn't have an answer for everything, which it would, I was really scared, but thankfully my mom was there and uh, she would rub my feet to, uh, to help me through the pain. And that was, that was pretty cool. Uh, what are <laughs> some of the other things that your mom did uh, during this time to, to help you get through this? I couldn't possibly say them all. Um, she got food for me. She did, she'd monitor my, um, my bathroom duties. She, mm -hmm. she would, uh, give me my medicine. She would watch my IVs. She would, uh, she would hold my hand just in case, uh, the needles were, were, uh, were being a little tough on me, even though, I was a tough kid. Uh, um, she, as I said, she would. Um, um, Rutger uh, had a uh, donated liver from um, a deceased donor. Uh, his name was Kale Kastanik, and he was 28 years old and a race car driver. And uh, and and you know he was so wonderful and, and and chose to give the gift of life. And since then, we have met his mom and his stepdad and his family, and they're wonderful. And we spend every year with his family uh, honoring him at his memorial lapse um, at the raceway where he was killed. And uh, that family means so much to us. He, he will always be our hero who. When we as humans face the hardships of life, what is often taken for granted comes into a much clearer perspective. If we are our mother's world, then she is the sun, the one that literally and figuratively gives us life. My mother, always by my side, helped me through this process more than any medicine or IV or x-ray possibly could. I love her so much, and even to this day she reminds me of when to take my medicine, how to keep clean, and how to live a life that before I had no idea even existed. I couldn't possibly repay her, though she believes that I could by doing one thing, loving her with all my liver. With